So, ladies and gentlemen, today we have Dr. Jatin Cha from New York, USA, who will be giving us a talk about the evolution of neck dissection. Thank you. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hisham. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I see my friend Ayman is online. Hello, Ayman. <clears throat> so, uh, as I understand, uh, nearly all of you are fellows in surgical oncology, and uh, yes. the neck is only a part of your uh, curriculum or your repertoire in surgical management. Nevertheless, uh, I think uh, surgical management of regional lymph nodes uh, falls well within the uh, purview of a surgical oncologist, <clears throat> whether it is neck dissection, uh, it is axillary dissection or groin dissection, uh, the principles remain the same. So what I will do during the course of the next uh, several minutes is to uh, give you a brief uh, tour through the history of development of sur surgical management of lymph node metastasis uh, and where we have come from and the rationale behind our current philosophy of uh, surgical management and dwell a little bit upon uh, the issues in surgical technique, uh, share with you some data on efficacy of surgical management uh, and finally conclude with uh, management of the neck where uh, there is persistent disease following uh, previous radiation or chemotherapy uh, and what do we do in a, in a salvage situation. So let me see if I can share my screen with you. Uh, okay, let me... Try to get the full screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's perfect, working fine. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we are going to uh, take a tour through the evolution of this process of surgical management of lymph nodes in the neck. Now, we all know that the success of the treatment of any head and neck cancer, whether it is mucosal or cutaneous, is directly related to the stage of the tumor at the time of initial presentation. Uh, and the survival or curability directly depends upon whether the primary tumor is confined to the primary site or has already uh, migrated to regional lymph nodes. And as you can see, this is data for oral cancer. Uh, when the primary tumor is confined only to the primary site, uh, a cure rates in excess of 80% is anticipated. However, by the time the disease spreads to regional lymph nodes, that cure rate drops to nearly half of what you would achieve in an early staged uh, mucosal cancers of the head and neck. So you can now conclude uh, that observation with this statement that the single most important prognostic factor in squamous carcinoma of the head and neck is the status of the cervical lymph nodes. Uh, not only it is important to assess them, but to anticipate the risk of metastasis to regional lymph nodes and be proactive in its management. Now, this is not new knowledge. This was well known nearly 200 years ago. Uh, Maximilian Joseph von Kilius, in his writings, wrote that cure was not possible when glands were involved by cancer. By glands, he meant cervical lymph nodes. So even uh, nearly 200 years ago, it was uh, well established that the curability of uh, mucosal cancers in the head and neck uh, was significantly low if the disease had spread uh, to the lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, some 10 years uh, following his writing, uh, John, John Warren at the Harvard uh, Institute in Boston attempted surgical removal of lymph nodes at, in the submandibular triangle. And here is a historical picture of J.C. Warren operating. Uh, that's him here uh, under ether anesthesia uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston uh, attempting to do 
a limited excision of cervical lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, fast forward to 1880, Theodore Coker from Bern in Switzerland recommended excision of neck nodes uh, for metastatic cancer and described his incision, the Y-shaped Coker incision for neck dissection in 1880. Uh, two years later, Richard von Folkman reported two cases of radical excision of neck nodes. He had actually done four patients, but the mortality was 50%, so only two patients survived, and he reported on those two patients uh, for surgical success in the management of uh, cervical lymph nodes. However, it was in 1888, a Polish surgeon, Franczak Jaudinski, uh, described in Polish language in the Polish Gazeta, a weekly newspaper, the surgical technique of radical excision of neck metastasis. In fact, what he described was a, a surgical technique of excision of lymph nodes at level four in the neck, requiring excision of the jugular vein and the adjacent structures. Uh, around the turn of the previous century, uh, he, uh, Sir Henry Trentham Butlin, in his Ontarian lecture in 1900, re-emphasized the importance of regional lymph nodes in tongue cancer in particular, and recommended uh, an operation to remove lymph nodes in this part of the neck. Today, we call this supra omohyoid triangle. That was not the word he used, but this is the picture from his pre uh, presentation in the Ontarian lecture, where he showed that lymph nodes in this area were important for excision uh, for tongue cancer. Uh, five years later, George Croy in the United States from Cleveland Clinic reported results of a systematic monoblock resection of regional lymph nodes uh, and described the technique of what he called then radical neck dissection step by step uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1907. Uh, 1907. Uh, in 1951, Hayes Martin, the former chief of the head and neck service, uh, popularized radical neck dissection in surgical management of head and neck cancer and wrote a beautiful article in the journal Cancer. The article was 45 pages long no medical journal in modern days would, would accept a 45 page long article. But it's an excellent historical article to read if you have access to the, that issue of cancer in 1952. No, uh, realizing the morbidity of radical neck dissection, Oswaldo Suarez, professor of surgery and anatomy in Argentina, described the technique of functional neck dissection for removal of lymph nodes for cancers of the larynx and pharynx, preserving the non-anatomic structures, uh, sternomastoid muscle, jugular vein, et cetera, to minimize morbidity of the operation. And uh, he called the operation functional neck dissection because function of the vital structures in the neck was preserved. It's interesting, two European surgeons, Ettore Bocca from Italy, and Cesar Gavilan from Spain went to Argentina to observe Oswaldo Suarez do the functional neck dissection and brought the technique of functional neck dissection to Europe and published in the English literature for the first time a series of patients undergoing functional neck dissection for laryngeal cancer uh, in uh, 1964. <clears throat> Ten years later, in 1974, Robert Lindbergh, a radiation oncologist from the MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, for the first time reported on distribution of lymph node metastasis from various primary sites, highlighting the fact that all lymph nodes at all levels in the neck are not at risk for every primary site. There is a selective pattern of nodal metastasis for each primary site. By 1980, CT scans became available, and five years later, MRI became available, now allowing us 
to see the internal anatomy of the neck that we could not visualize before uh, other than by palpation. In 1988, uh, Bob Byers from MD Anderson and uh, we from Memorial Hospital described patterns of lymph node metastasis in surgical specimen of neck dissections to identify which are the lymph nodes at highest risk for each primary site in the neck. And thus uh, allowing us the philosophy of doing selective oper operations, <coughs> excuse me, selective operations for surgical management of lymph nodes in the neck. In 1991, the American Academy of Otolaryngology standardized the terminology for neck dissections because there was a huge confusion. Uh, the word modified neck dissection was used right and left, and what it meant had uh, yet to be defined. Because every time a surgeon used the word modified neck dissection, it was his or her modification, not specifying what that operation meant. <clears throat> and we will expand upon that further down. In 1993, Donald Morton introduced the concept of sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, rather than elective operation on the clinically negative regional lymph nodes. Uh, in 1995, Michael Vanden Brecken and Gordon Snow popularized the technique of ultrasound guided final respiration biopsy of neck nodes before embarking upon elective lymph node dissection. <clears throat> David Souter from Glasgow studied the role of sentinel node biopsy and published on it in oral cancer in 2000. Uh, PET scans became available now uh, by this time. I cannot talk right now. Uh, my apologies. Uh, the uh, American Academy, uh, as I mentioned, chaired by Tom Robbins in 2000, revised the terminology and definitions of neck dissections. Uh, since 2000, well, for the past 20, 21 years, we have been through basic research in search for biomarkers of the primary tumor to predict, identify, and hopefully prevent neck metastasis. But this is, that is still work in progress. In 2006, Alfio Ferlito and co-authors proposed a synoptic recording of neck dissections to uh, clarify the confusing technology, uh, the confusion in the nomenclature of various neck dissections. And uh, uh, in the past 10, 15 years, uh, Selective or modified neck dissections have become the standards of care. Classical radical neck dissection is rarely performed these days, and we will define when. There is increasing need for salvage neck dissections of, after chemo and radiotherapy because of many patients receiving non-surgical uh, treatment with combinations of chemo and radiation. And the incisions used for neck dissections have changed and have now become standardized. So this is a brief history of evolution as to where we have come from in the management of neck metastasis. <clears throat> Let's now get to the basics. When you talk about neck dissection, what are the lymph nodes that you are talking about? Anatomically, regional lymph nodes in the neck are uh, consider those in the preauricular and postauricular region cephalar, suboccipital region in the posterior part of the neck, and down to the supraclavicular region uh, at, uh, at, uh, in the supraclavicular fossa in the lateral aspect of the neck and the uh, central compartment in the sternal notch region uh, in the distal part of the neck. So all lymph nodes in the midline, pretracheal, pre-laryngeal, sub-mantle, sub-mandibular, uh, deep jugular lymph nodes in the upper part of the neck, lower part, middle of the neck, lower part of the neck, lymph nodes along the accessory nerve in the posterior triangle of the neck, 
and those along the transverse cervical artery, they are all considered regional lymph nodes of the neck. In order to put some law and order into the description of these lymph nodes, uh, at Memorial Hospital in New York, for the first time, the concept of leveling of lymph nodes was introduced in the late uh, 1920s and early 1930s. Unfortunately, I cannot find any one individual to give credit for the description of lymph nodes in the neck. It came from the head and neck service at Memorial, but no one individual is identified. What they described was uh, uh, five levels of lymph nodes in the lateral aspect of the neck, those lymph nodes in the submandibular triangle called level one, those in the upper, mid, and lower jugular chain as levels two, three, and four, and those in the posterior triangle at le as level five, and lymph nodes in the central compartment were called level six lymph nodes. Uh, the American Academy further uh, uh, refined this leveling system, dividing level one into 1A and 1B, 1A being submental lymph nodes and 1B submandibular lymph nodes. Level 2A would be lymph nodes in the upper jugular chain anterior to the accessory nerve, and level 2B posterior to the accessory nerve. And similarly, in level five, 5A and 5B were divided, 5A being those lymph nodes above the transfer cervical artery at the apex of the posterior triangle, and level 5B being, being in the supraclavicular fossa below the transfer cervical artery. Lymph nodes in the central compartment were divided into level six, uh, being the uh, pre-laryngeal, pre-tracheal, tracheoesophageal groove, and paratracheal lymph nodes. And level seven would be the superior mediastinal in the anterior superior mediastinum above the nominate artery would be considered level seven. Now, in order to understand the need for management, we need to appreciate what are the nodal factors which impact upon outcomes of treatment of patients with head and neck cancer. So first and foremost is clinical status. Are they clinically involved uh, or they are not? Are they palpable or they are not? If they are palpably enlarged, how big are they? And how many are they uh, are important uh, prognostic parameters. Extra nodal extension has come into the uh, uh, fore in the last several years as one of the most important prognostic factor in the uh, prognostic influence of nodal metastasis in the, in the neck. Level of involvement of the lymph nodes in the neck and presence of tumor emboli are all prognostic factors which impact upon outcome. In the past 20 years, HPV status of the lymph node metastasis has emerged as an important prognostic factor, and we will expand upon that as we go further along. Along with this, lymph node density has been reported <coughs> as an important factor impacting upon outcome. What this means is the number of lymph nodes involved by metastatic cancer divided by the number of lymph nodes removed at the time of an operation. So lymph node density is a ratio uh, between number of lymph nodes excised in the surgical specimen, of which how many were positive and how many were negative. The lower the ratio, the better the prognosis, because it implies that there is limited spread of lymph nodes in the neck. The, the American Joint Committee on Staging System up until 2009 uh, considered only the volume of metastatic cancer in the lymph nodes as an important factor in addition to the laterality and the multiplicity of lymph nodes. So for a single lymph node, less than three centimeters uh, at one level on one side would be considered N1. Uh, a lymph node larger than one, uh, three centimeters, three to six would be N2A. Multiple ipsilateral lymph nodes would be N2B, 
bilateral lymph nodes would be end to C, and a lymph node larger than six centimeter would be considered N3. This was a good system. It predicted prognosis well and worked well. And you can see this using those criteria, patients with negative lymph nodes had an 84% five-year survival. This is for oral cancer. Once a, even a single lymph node was involved, the survival at five years dropped to 58%. And with multiple lymph nodes or large lymph node involvement, it dropped down to 46%. So the nodal staging system based on volume and number of metastatic nodes uh, did impact upon outcome and accurately reflected outcome uh, on survival uh, for patients with head and neck cancer. However, in the eighth edition, the current AJCC staging system went one step further realizing that extra nodal extension was a significantly important prognostic factor, even more important than the size or multiplicity of lymph nodes. Presence of extra nodal extension <clears throat> is recorded by clinical findings, uh, fixity of lymph nodes, presence of cranial node paralysis, uh, adherence of the overlying skin, are all manifestations of extra nodal extension. <clears throat> Radiological features uh, uh, of uh, fuzzy margins would also be uh, a factor uh, impacting upon uh, the presence of uh, extra nodal extension. And finally, pathological analysis would be the final de determinant of ENE and uh, uh, in the uh, assessment of lymph nodes by a pathologist. So much is the impact of extra nodal extension on outcome that the presence of extra nodal extension immediately upstages the a tumor to an N3. So here is the current uh, uh, AJCC nodal staging system. For all other nodal stages, the same system, system as the previous addition uh, remains in force. But the moment extra nodal extension is present, it becomes an N3 disease, N3B, the highest nodal staging that can be uh, attributed uh, to the nodal metastasis. And here is a pictorial view that all other nodal uh, volumes and number and laterality keep the staging nodal system at below N3. Once the nodal metastasis break through the capsule of the lymph node, whether the lymph node is small or big, it will upstage the lymph node to N3B. So we now realize that extra nodal extension is the most important prognostic factor in neck node metastasis from head neck cancer. Now, in most instances, surgery is the preferred initial treatment in majority of patients with nodal metastasis from primary head and neck carcinomas. And the standard surgical procedure in the past used to be the classical radical neck dissection. Uh, the operation was oncologically complete and surgically safe as it was shown over 50 years. But the radical neck dissection produced significant functional and aesthetic morbidity uh, as, see, as you see in a patient like this. This patient with tongue cancer, cancer has been cured over 10 years, but has a lifelong disability, aesthetic deformity, shoulder drooping, uh, and painful movement of the shoulder joint as functional debility following radical neck dissection, which is lifelong. If you did the operation bilaterally, uh, you see a deformity like this. And if the operation was done concurrently in conjunction with laryngectomy, this is a scenario you will see in the recovery room on the patient soon after the operation due to loss of bilateral internal jugular veins, as well as the parapharyngeal veins in the prevertebral plexus due to laryngectomy. With passage of time, this venous edema will subside, but the chronic lymphedema of the neck will persist lifelong. <clears throat> 
So radical leg dissection had significant morbidity and it had to be reconsidered as the only available surgical procedure. To reduce the morbidity of radical neck dissection, less morbid, modified operations were introduced, which were oncologically equally effective, but functionally and aesthetically superior. I mentioned to you in the history, the functional neck dissection uh, described by, uh, by Oswaldo uh, uh, Ferra from Argentina, uh, which uh, described the functional neck dissection clearing all five levels of lymph nodes in the neck. But this required uh, patients at risk for of micrometastasis. It was also not necessary to, uh, to understand, uh, uh, it was not necessary to dissect all five, so five levels of lymph nodes if we understood the patterns of neck metastasis. <clears throat> so who are the patients at risk for example, in oral cancer, uh, of having micrometastasis in the clinically negative neck. Patients who have a high stage primary tumor, T3 or T4, high grade histology, poorly differentiated carcinoma, indifference to a well differentiated cancer. Uh, tumors which are deeply infiltrating. Some primary sites have a higher risk, like buccal mucosa and tongue. And in general, tumors posteriorly located in the uh, upper aerobic digestive tract, base of the tongue, or oropharynx, hypopharynx, have a higher risk compared to cancers of the oral cavity. So then what is the value of neck dissection in 21st century? Uh, it is diagnostic in the N0 neck, whether you have micrometastasis or not. If you did the neck dissection in the N0 neck, uh, it would provide you with proper staging, uh, whether the neck is indeed N0 or what is the extent of nodal metastasis in the neck to assess the need for post-operative treatment. And in some patients with limited neck disease, the operation would be therapeutic. And it is also required for salvage in post-radiation or post-chemoradiation persistent neck disease in the neck. So, the operation is indeed required, but the question is what operation should we do in the management of neck metastasis today? <clears throat> so we need to identify which are the first HLON regional lymph node groups and their respective primary sites. This is not possible in groin metastasis or to a limited extent in axillary metastasis, because the patterns of metastasis in that, those regional lymph nodes are not identifiable and predictable. Quite in contrast to head and neck, for each primary site, there is a select group of regional lymph nodes which are at risk for initial involvement. And there is a systematic progressive pattern of neck metastasis, skip metastasis, are indeed exceedingly rare. For example, in the study we did some 25 years ago, squamous carcinoma of the tongue, we looked at uh, elective neck dissections for the N0 neck uh, in patients in those days who had undergone radical neck dissections. So we had the neck dissection specimen available at all five levels. And we found that Micrometastasis or occult metastasis were seen mostly in levels one, two, and three, rarely at level four, and never in level five. So, level five was not required to be dissected in the clinically negative neck for oral cancer. Similarly, for larynx and hypopharynx cancer, lymph nodes at level one and level five were rarely involved. Level two, three, and four were the ones at risk. So we were now able to identify uh, first HNR lymph nodes for oral cavity confined to levels one, two, and three shown here for uh, primary sites of larynx and pharynx. The first HNR lymph nodes were confined to levels two, three, and four, ipsilateral, 
or bilateral depending upon whether the primary tumor crosses the midline or not. For tumors of the parotid gland, the first achenoid lymph nodes were periparotid and levels 1, 2, and 3 in the neck. Similarly, for submandibular gland, again, level 1, 2, and 3. For thyroid cancer, the first retinal lymph nodes were the central compartment level 6 lymph nodes and level 4 lymph nodes in the lateral neck. And therefore, we published extensively that the patterns of cervical lymph node metastasis for head and neck cancers were predictable and there was sequential progression of metastatic spread from each primary site. Select group of regional lymph nodes were at risk of initial involvement and skip metastasis are rare. Therefore, we had now a choice of doing the operation in patients at risk of micrometastasis. Now, from the operations we had available in those days, classical radical neck dissection, extended neck dissection, or modified neck dissection, we had to move on to further subdivide the modified neck dissection, which uh, initially intended to dissect all uh, groups of lymph nodes, which was a comprehensive modified neck dissection, and move on to a selective lymph node dissection where you selectively remove only limited groups of lymph nodes, preserving the non-lymphatic vital structures to avoid the morbidity of uh, the removal of non-lymphatic structures in terms of function and aesthetic appearance. So the comprehensive neck dissection, which includes all five levels, would then consist of classical radical neck dissection, extended neck dissection, and a modified radical neck dissection uh, including types one, two, and three, type one, which selectively preserves the spinal accessory nerve, type two, modified comprehensive neck dissection, selectively preserving the spinal accessory nerve and the sternomastoid muscle, and type three, preserving the nerve, the muscle, and the internal jugular vein. Each of these selective comprehensive neck dissections have specific indications, which I will expand upon. On the other hand, selective neck dissections include the removal of only select group of regional lymph nodes in the lateral neck, and these are supra omohyoid neck dissection, <clears throat> removing levels one, two, and three, jugular node dissection, removing levels two, three, and four, posterior lateral neck dissection, removing levels two, three, four, five, and suboccipital lymph nodes and central compartment dissection, removing levels six and seven. So these are selective operations allowing the removal of select group of first echelon lymph nodes for each primary site. <clears throat> now, in the literature, there is a confusion in nomenclature. Here are some names of the modified neck dissections I collected from the literature and you can add on even more uh, names described than in the literature. Some of the common names are modified radical neck dissection, comprehensive neck dissection, selective neck dissection, classical neck dissection, functional neck dissection, modified dissection, etc. None of these tell you what the surgeon exactly did. So there is a lack of precision in the nomenclature. The terms elective, prophylactic, therapeutic, or salvage reflect the indication of the operation, but not the extent, and therefore that should be avoided. The terms conservative, functional, and limited reflect the intent of the operation, but not the extent of the operation, and therefore that should be removed. And the terms Kreil, Martin, Suarez, Boca, etc., recognize the individuals who describe the operation and popularize the operation, but does not detail the extent of the operation, and that should be avoided. 
the proposed dissection, neck dissection nomenclature should be synoptic. It should use the word ND for neck dissection using the prefix L for left and R for right, including, including the levels of lymph nodes removed uh, and each designated by Roman numerals one through seven. And the third component of the synoptic nomenclature should include the non lymphatic structure removed. To give you an example, <clears throat> the proposed uh, nomenclature for a comprehensive neck dissection would be ND 1 5 SCM IJV CN 11. In very few letters, the entire operation is described in, in detail. You don't need two paragraphs to describe the operation. Let's say, say you have done a supra omohyoid neck dissection. It will be simply ND one to three. And that tells the reader what operation did you do. Radical neck dissection today is a rare operation and it is limited only in patients with N3 disease where there is gross invasion of the accessory nerve, where there are multiple gross metastases with, uh, with uh, obvious indications of extra nodal extension, and if there is recurrent disease following previous chemo radiotherapy. Here is a case in point. This is the kind of patient who would need a classical radical neck dissection. And here you can justify the morbidity of the operation because of the extent of the disease which warranted that procedure. You may need more than a radical neck dissection to include retropharyngeal, parapharyngeal lymph nodes, mediastinal lymph nodes, and even axillary lymph nodes depending on a specific pathology. Here is a case in point, a young woman with a melanoma excise from here with supraclavicular and superior mediastinal lymph nodes showing an extended neck dissection including a comprehensive lateral neck dissection and mediastinal node dissection to remove the lymph node just inferior to the innominate artery. Here is a surgical field with a sternotomy, neck dissection completed, accessory nerve preserved, the, the carotid sheath preserved, vagus and phrenic nerves preserved, and here is the uh, innominate artery with the lymph node removed from that area that's the surgical specimen of the neck dissection, the mediastinal lymph node, and patient's postoperative appearance clearing a, the uh, required lymph node removal with an extended comprehensive neck dissection. Modified comprehensive neck dissection type one, preserving only the accessory nerve, is indicated in those patients who have clinically palpable lymph node metastasis in the anterior triangle of the neck, as you see in this patient. Here we used a trifurcate incision, uh, making an attempt first to identify the accessory nerve first, trace its course through the sternomastoid muscle, identify and preserve the nerve, and complete the rest of the operation like a radical neck dissection, removing lymph nodes at levels two, three, four, uh, and completing the operation, clearing all fields in the neck, preserving only the accessory nerve, and reducing the morbidity of a shoulder droop, and therefore preserving the function of the accessory nerve. This is comprehensive the, uh, modified neck dissection type one. The comprehensive neck dissection type three, where you preserve the jugular vein, sternomastoid muscle, and accessory nerve, is an operation recommended for thyroid cancer with gross metastasis. Here is a patient with a papillary carcinoma of the thyroid gland with clinically palpable bilateral neck metastasis, preserving the parathyroid gland as you see here and completing clearance of lateral neck lymph nodes from the carotid sheath at levels two, three, four with the sternomastoid retracted laterally and with the retraction of sternomastoid anteriorly, clearing the posterior triangle of the neck, the accessory nerve, the carotid sheath, 
and clearance of center compartment and lateral neck lymph nodes and the post-operative appearance of the patient undergoing bilateral comprehensive uh, de neck dissection type 3 for thyroid carcinoma. Selective neck dissections, on the other hand, are operations uh, recommended for removal of select group of regional lymph nodes in a systematic monoblock fashion where there is risk of occult metastasis. supra neck dissection, clearing levels lymph, uh, levels 1, 2, and 3, is recommended for oral cancer uh, uh, where the risk of micrometastasis is present by virtue of uh, the characteristics of the primary tumor. You may want to extend the supraomohyoid neck dissection to level four, uh, particularly for tumors of the lateral tongue where there may be risk of extension of metastasis to level four. The operation is carried through a single transverse incision, uh, initially beginning with identification of the marginal branch of the facial nerve, uh, preserving that, clearing lymph nodes at level one, uh, preserving the lingual nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, uh, and then focusing your attention to lymph nodes at levels two and three, uh, preserving the accessory nerve, retracting the sternomastoid muscle, taking the common facial vein, and here is the surgical field after removal of lymph nodes at levels one, two, and three. Uh, and uh, uh, I, time won't permit me to get into a video, but it is available on the website of IFNOS. I will give that to you to see the procedure at length. Okay. Uh, the post-operative appearance of the same patient is uh, showing an aesthetic, excellent aesthetic outcome, no shoulder droop, preservation of the sternomastoid muscle, incision in the natural skin, skin crease, and no aesthetic or functional morbidity, giving you the information you need. Jugular node dissection is an elective operation you do, do for primary tumors of the larynx of the, or the pharynx, where micrometastases are uh, likely to be present at levels two, three, and four. And here is a, a patient with a carcinoma of the supraglottic larynx showing bilateral level two, three, four dissection with the surgical specimen harvested levels two, three, and four in right uh, and left uh, side of the neck and, and patient's post-operative appearance uh, with preservation of aesthetics and function. Posterior lateral neck dissection is recommended for tumors of the skull or posterior scalp in particular, as you see in this patient with a melanoma of the skull. And here is the primary tumor excised with clearance of suboccipital lymph nodes and lymph nodes at levels two, three, four, and five in the lateral neck uh, for clearance of regional lymph nodes at risk for this primary tumor in patients post-operative appearance. <clears throat> Central compartment node dissection, as I say, is recommended for those patients with thyroid cancer, uh, where nodal metastases are quite common and limited metastasis to central neck is a scenario quite often seen in the in papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, where you clear the lymph nodes in the pretracheal and prelaryngeal region, tracheoesophageal region, preserving the recurrent nerve the superior and inferior parathyroid glands and clearance of the entire central compartment lymph nodes in the neck. So that would be the operation that you would propose for thyroid cancer if you need to clear the central compartment lymph nodes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the incisions for neck dissections have drastically changed. In modern days, there is only one incision employed for any type of neck dissection, and that is a single transverse incision in a natural skin crease. Here is a uh, skin crease uh, in, for a supra neck dissection you would use for oral cancer. You, uh, you can use that for laryngeal or pharyngeal cancer in the lower part of the neck, in the upper part of the neck, skin crease for oral cancer. 
here is for bilateral neck dissections, here is for thyroid cancer, here is for thyroid cancer for bilateral neck dissection, and here is a single skin case for parotid cancer, including parotidectomy and lateral neck dissection. No vertical component in the neck is required to access lymph nodes in the lateral neck. Aesthetically, a vertical component is poor and gives a unpleasant appearance to the uh, patient's aesthetic outcome. So in modern days, a single uh, a transverse incision around a natural skin crease at any level of the neck required, depending upon the primary site, that uh, is the indication for the operation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are many patients today who will undergo non-surgical treatment first, uh, such as patients with HPV positive cancers in the oropharynx, cancers of the tonsil or base of time, an increasing problem in the Western world, probably less so in, uh, in Egypt, but I'm sure it will follow uh, the trend uh, soon, if not uh, sooner, uh, in terms of the HPV positivity of oropharyngeal carcinomas. And most of those patients in modern days are treated with concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Some patients will have persistent disease requiring a salvage operation. So the question then arises, what do you do for the post-chemo radiotherapy neck? Do you operate you know, on everybody or you simply observe? Do you use a PET scan to assess uh, the need for neck dissection? Uh, and if you are going to do the neck dissection, what procedure would you employ? So PET scan is a highly reliable tool in patients to identify viable tumor. Uh, PET CT is better than uh, PET scan because it will identify the location in accurate uh, uh, superimposition of the PET findings on a CT scan. But you must wait for at least 12 weeks after the chemo radiation to do the PET scan. Otherwise, you're likely to get a false positive uh, PET scan. If a PET scan is done, uh, approximately 10 to 12 weeks following chemo radiation, and if the PET is positive, showing a high uh, FTG avidity, in over 90% of the patients, it is accurate in predicting persistent viable tumor. Uh, and therefore, uh, it would be an indication to proceed with appropriate neck dissection. The other issue to address is, uh, what do you do if at the time of salvage neck dissection, the disease is extensive and uh, it has involved adjacent structures such as the carotid sheath, the cranial nerves, uh, and you are concerned about residual disease in the post chemo radiation salvage neck dissection. Here is a case in point. Uh, this patient had persistent disease uh, at level two, requiring sacrifice of the external carotid artery, the vagus nerve, the hypoglossal could be preserved but there is concern about the margins in this part of the neck and what do you do because this patient is not suitable for re-radiation because of the previous use of external radiation therapy. So in these patients, uh, plan to have your radiation oncologist available for brachytherapy or intraoperative radiation therapy, as you see here <clears throat> with uh, after loading catheters, delivering uh, up to 1500 centigrade in a single dose during the surgery uh, to the areas at risk, giving a boost, if you will, to the high risk field for local recurrence. Another way to add further radiation to the high risk neck is a scenario where you uh, do after loading implants. A case in point is shown here persistent neck disease following chemo radiation for pharyngeal carcinoma. The plan is to do a, a comprehensive neck dissection with after loading implantation and coverage of that area with a pectoralis myocutaneous flap. And here is, you see the surgical field, the gross disease around carotid artery, uh, which required additional radiation with after loading catheters delivering 
for nearly full course, radi course radiation uh, and coverage of that area with a pectoral is flat. So you do have a backup to uh, those patients requiring salvage net resections. So what is the current philosophy of management of neck metastasis in uh, carcinomas of the head and neck? Uh, we do recommend radical neck dissection for bulky N3 disease at the outset. There are some patients uh, where you, we would consider uh, modified comprehensive neck dissection uh, type one, preserving only the accessory nerve for bulky N2 disease or clinical evidence or radiological evidence of extra nodal extension. Uh, modified comprehensive neck dissection type two would be recommended clearing levels two, three, four, and five for thyroid cancer. In all other scenarios, selective neck dissection, uh, but for select circumstances uh, in the clinically positive neck. For example, if you have oral cancer and disease only present at level one or level two A, there is no need to do a comprehensive neck dissection. You can do a therapeutic level one, two, three, four dissection, a selective comprehensive dissection of levels one, two, three, and four. In the clinically negative neck at risk of micrometastasis for oral cavity primary tumors, we recommend a supra omohyoid neck dissection clearing levels one, two, three only. A, for the clinically negative neck at risk of micrometastasis for laryngopharyngeal primary tumors, jugular node dissection clearing levels two, three, and four. Post-operative radiotherapy or chemoradiotherapy in patients with multiple positive nodes, in patients with extra nodal extension or positive margins, addition of chemotherapy to radiation, and other ominous features uh, such as lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, we would also recommend adding chemotherapy to post-operative radiotherapy. So what I have shared with you during the course of the uh, past hour is the understanding of the patterns of neck metastasis from primary sites in the head and neck area. Uh, uh, have you understand that there is a a uh, sequential progression of neck metastasis from each primary site, draining to first HNO lymph nodes first before going on to uh, subsequent levels of lymph nodes. For example, for oral cancer, levels one, two, three, and four remain at risk in over 96% of patients uh, before they will go to level four or five. So there is a sequential and predictable pattern of metastasis, allowing you to do selective, elective operations for each primary site, depending upon the nodal metastasis at risk, minimizing the morbidity, both aesthetic and functional of the operation. And therapeutic operations in those patients where you can preserve artery structures, keeping in mind the availability of post-operative radiotherapy or chemoradiotherapy, depending on the appropriate indications. I am ready to take any questions uh, from any of you. Uh, let me stop sharing. Uh, and I see Dr. Kafagi, my former colleague, is also online. Medad, good yes. to see you online. Uh, okay, please, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. Thank you, Dr. Shah, for this marvelous presentation. Let's see if we, if we have any questions from the audience. Please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Dr. Ayman? You have to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Dr. Ayman, unmute. Dr. Shah. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you hear me now? Yeah, I, I, we enjoyed your lecture. I just take the advantage to uh, uh, thank you very much accepting Hisham uh, invitation. 
And uh, I let, uh, on behalf of the Head and the Next Society and the National Cancer Institute, we always enjoy your cooperation with us. Now I will let the floor for the young generation to learn from your great experience. Thank you again. Many thanks, and it's an honor to participate. Okay, but Dr. Antar. We have a question from Dr. Antar. Yeah. From Yemen, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Jatin Shah, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Are you hear me? Yes, I can yes. Okay, uh, I want to ask uh, the first question about the papillary and the medullary thyroid carcinoma. Did you do a routine central neck dissection, uh, even it is uh, not negative clinically and radiological? This uh, question number one. Yeah. Uh, question number two, the most complication in uh, mostly in the modified neck dissection, including level five, is the shoulder uh, drop and the pain. What is the, how to avoid it and what is the management? I, I didn't get your second question clearly. Can you repeat that? Shoulder drop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's asking about shoulder drop, how to shoulder avoid, drop. how to manage it. So the first uh, question about uh, thyroid cancer, we do not uh, recommend or do elective central compartment lymph node dissection for micrometastasis from thyroid carcinoma. So the central compartment dissection for thyroid cancer is done for patients with clinically or grossly visible lymph nodes uh, that, that are uh, uh, found during the course of the operation, uh, but uh, and, no elective operation for negative nodes because the operation has significant morbidity in terms of devascularizing the parathyroid glands. And if the nodes are negative, you would have produced unnecessary morbidity. So for papillary carcinoma of thyroid, no elective central compartment lymph node dissection, only for grossly enlarged and histologically confirmed neck metastasis during surgery to complete the central node dissection. Patients who have a shoulder drop, uh, first of all, uh, if you have to sacrifice the accessory nerve, that is unavoidable. In some patients whom you have preserved the accessory nerve, you may also see shoulder drop because the nerve undergoes avascular uh, necrosis uh, due to lack of vascularity to the nerve, even though the nerve is anatomically preserved, functionally you may see a shoulder drop. So there is no surgical procedure that would fix the shoulder drop. The, the best uh, management of uh, avoiding a shoulder drop and minimizing painful shoulder syndrome is active physiotherapy in those patients in whom you have sacrificed the nerve starting two weeks following surgery. Let's say you have done a radical neck dissection. You know that that patient will have developed shoulder droop. You start physiotherapy, uh, both passive and active, uh, two weeks after the surgery and continue until the patient strengthens the remaining trapezius muscle and gains enough strength to, to reduce or minimize the shoulder droop. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Mithar, you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Mithar Khafega. Thank you, Dr. Sher. And you are welcome the entire really. We enjoyed your talk. It's very comprehensive. Uh, there is only one question. Yes. Uh, what is the indication of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, after uh, doing a, a good operation with no residual tumor? Uh, especially, do you do it? Do you give it in high risk patients for example, extra nodal extension or uh, anything else? I know that uh, head and neck cancer usually they don't. So, I think so, they don't do this and metastasis. 
your your question is because adding chemotherapy is not a walk in the park it inflicts significantly increased long term sequela and toxicity so you have to have sufficient indication to add chemotherapy to post operative radiation and the randomized trials done by urtc and uh, uh, and the uh, rtog uh, showed that uh, positive margins and extra nodal extension were factors which produced improved outcomes in terms of local regional control and reduction of the risk of distant metastasis if you added chemotherapy to post operative radiation uh, remember adding chemotherapy does not eliminate uh, recurrence it reduces the recurrence rate uh, by about 10 to 12 percent uh, compared to radiation alone. So there is a 10 to 12 percent benefit by adding chemotherapy to radiation for those patients who have positive margins, extra nodal extension, uh, residual primary tumor, a T4 and 3 disease, even if the margins are clear, has a very high risk of recurrence in the regional area. But those are the only indications. And again, remember, it will not eliminate recurrence. It will only reduce the recurrence by about 12% by adding chemo to radiation. How about the, the, the indication for checkpoint inhibitors, especially, of course, in melanoma, stage 3 melanoma of the other neck? Uh, how, how about adding what? A checkpoint inhibitor. A checkpoint inhib inhibitors. I, I no. can't make a comment because there is no significant data available to uh, to use that as adjuvant treatment. So uh, I think you know uh, on a if you have an inst institutional trial going on, I would encourage you to participate. But in the absence of a documented uh, valid uh, outcome from a well controlled trial. I would be hesitant to recommend uh, checkpoint inhibitors or uh, immunotherapy uh, uh, on an ad hoc basis because we don't know the outcome. Patient goes through tremendous expense without knowing the potential benefit. So we have to wait for the results of uh, uh, clinically well-conducted trials before recommending that. Thank you. And you are again welcome in Cairo. We hope to see you in Cairo. Oh, hope so someday. Okay. Dr. Gamal Amero. There's a question on the chat box, indication for new adjuvant chem chemotherapy in lymphadenopathy. So new adjuvant chemotherapy, also called induction chemotherapy, has been employed in clinical trials, uh, uh, randomized uh, to those patients, particularly for organ preservation, uh, who would be treated with concurrent chemo radiation without induction and with induction. Uh, and induction chemotherapy showed no uh, benefit, added increased toxicity, uh, and many patients did not go on to complete the concurrent chemo radiation regimen because they were simply tired of the toxicity and the side effects. So today, new adjuvant chemotherapy does not have an established role in head and neck cancer. Okay, Dr. Jamal Amero. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this wonderful lecture. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. How are you, sir? Very well. Uh, for for nodal recurrence in uh, thyroid cancer, repeated recurrence of nodal uh, origin. What do you suggest for this? What is the best for recurrent nodal? So, so remember, uh, nodal recurrence in thyroid cancer is a reflection of an incomplete first operation. If you look at the literature, the recurrence rates for papillary carcinoma have been reported anywhere from 3% to 30%. <clears throat> and multiple recurrences occur because it's like trying to catch the tiger by the tail. 
if your first operation was incomplete, clearing all nodes at risk, then you're gonna get multiple recurrences. And thyroid cancer in, in principle is a surgical disease. A grossly apparent nodal metastasis is not going to be uh, controlled by radioactive iodine treatment or by external radiation therapy. So unfortunately, those patients will require repeated surgery. But if it is the second or the third time, my suggestion would be to go ahead and complete the operation that should have been done the first time around and not, not go to pluck out only the recurrent node because that's going to recur at some other place that was not dissected. So complete the com comprehensive operation that anytime you go back in to remove the recurrent nodal metastasis. If the patient has persistently elevated thyroglobulin after your operation for recurrent thyroid cancer, then that patient may benefit from radioactive iodine for microscopic or occult microscopic minute papillary carcinoma. But for gross nodal disease, surgery is the only effective treatment. Uh, if I have a massive recurrence or massive uh, nodes in the primary surgery, massive nodes around the jugular vein, around the accessory, I, I, I am... Uh, uh, allowed to do radical section from the first operation or no? no Sometimes first, I find about 30 positive nodes. Yeah, first of all, we do not do ra radical neck dissection for thyroid cancer because radical neck dissection is a historical operation today. Uh, and thyroid cancer is not a aggressive invasive cancer. So all the neck dissections done for thyroid cancer are modified operations to preserve the accessory nerve, the sternomastoid muscle, and if possible, the jugular vein. That's principle number one. Principle number two, we do not do elective operations for micrometastasis from papillary carcinoma because micrometastasis are present in nearly 50% of patients with papillary carcinoma, but they hardly ever come to become clinical cancers in a majority of patients. If you look at all patients with papillary carcinoma, and if you do elective lateral neck dissection, nearly 50% will have micrometastasis. But you compare them to those patients who, have, who are observed and who do not have elective neck dissection and only four to 5% become clinically apparent neck, neck metastasis. So that means we would have done 96 unnecessary elective operations to potentially benefit four or five patients. So elective regional node dissection for thyroid cancer is not recommended. Uh, we would do only therapeutic operations for gross metastasis, either documented preoperatively by palpation, by imaging, by CT scan, by ultrasound, or identified grossly during thyroidectomy. Thanks very much. Thank you. Dr. Walid Akmal and then Dr. Ahab Sayyad. Hello, Professor Shah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks a lot for your marvelous presentation. And we all admire that. I would like to ask you a question regarding the role of uh, lymph node biopsy in head and neck cancer. That's uh, the first question. And the second question, what about the indication of planned neck dissection after chemo radiation neck cancers? Uh, the first question was what about immunotherapy? The role of sentinel lymph node in head and neck cancers. Sentinel lymph node. Okay, so sentinel lymph node uh, is a, a good procedure but it has very limited applicability. It can be employed only for accessible oral cancers, tongue and floor of mouth. Uh, it uh, can be employed for larynx, pharynx, uh, etc. It cannot be employed for salivary gland cancer. Uh, the lymph nodes that you harvest from a sentinel node biopsy uh, are on an average two to three lymph nodes. 
and the incision you employ is about three centimeters. In contrast, if you were to do a selective, elective, supra omohyoid neck dissection, which mm -hmm. requires a eight centimeter incision in the natural skin crease, you harvest on an average uh, mm -hmm. 20 to 25 lymph nodes, giving you better mm -hmm. assessment of the first retinal lymph nodes, and the morbidity is minimal. If the lymph nodes contain micrometastasis, you don't have to go back, you've already done the operation. And conversely, if you do set in the node biopsy and if you find positive node, you are going to have to go back to do to, to complete the operation. So there are some advocates who like sent in the node biopsy. We do not practice that for these reasons that it has very limited applicability. Uh, it gives you limit, limited information and it avoids, uh, it requires a second operation if the nodes come back positive. And therefore, we do not recommend that, no. And what was your second question? The indications of planned neck dissection after chemo radiation. Plan, oh, planned neck dissection, now we rarely do because PET scans are very uh, effective in assessing viable nodes so because sometimes you will feel uh, ill-defined thickening at the site of previously palpable nodes after chemo radiation. And your concern in your mind, is it cancer or is it not cancer? Needle biopsy does not help. Uh, so uh, we would heavily rely on uh, a PET scan rather than uh, do a planned neck dissection. If the PET is positive with a significantly high SUV, uh, two to three months post chemo radiation, there is viable residual cancer and we would go ahead and do a neck dissection in that setting. It may be a limited neck dissection, not comprehensive, excising only the lymph nodes at the site of clinically palpable lymph nodes and not going to other sites. But we don't now practice planned neck dissection post chemo radiation. Okay, thanks a lot. Dr. Ahab Sayyad. Hello, Dr. Shah. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, thyroid cancer, whether papillary or medullary thyroid cancer and the central uh, lymph node uh, dissection. If I have central lymph node positive in an epsilateral group of lymph node, uh, do we have a concept of uh, ipsilateral central neck dissection or still the concept of bilateral or from carotid to carotid as we knew before? So I think, you know, again, remember, the more you do, the more morbidity you are risking. Papillary mm -hmm. carcinoma is not a fatal cancer. So if I have found ipsilateral lymph nodes during thyroidectomy, I'm going to think three things. Am I doing a lobectomy or am I doing a total thyroidectomy for the primary tumor? I would carefully palpate the contralateral tracheoesophageal group. If the primary tumor requires only a lobectomy and you have a couple of lymph nodes on the ipsilateral tracheoesophageal group, then I would be perfectly happy with a lobectomy and ipsilateral T group node dissection. Conversely, if your primary tumor requires a total thyroidectomy, uh, you have multiple lymph nodes along the TE groove. Or when you palpate the contralateral side, you are not sure whether they, you palpate something or not, then go ahead and complete the operation on bilateral TE groove. So I think it's a judgment call. It's not a yes or no. Every patient, we have to make the decision intraoperatively. Well, Hisham, I think I, oh, I, I'm sure there is a question on, uh, on medullary carcinoma. Uh, so for medullary carcinoma also, the general principles are similar that you do not do elective lateral neck dissection. However, if the primary medullary carcinoma is fairly large, and if you are, you, you are doing a total thyroidectomy, I would be inclined to recommend elective central compartment node dissection at that time.
to avoid the morbidity of hypoparathyroidism if you have to come back the second time. So elective central compartment node dissection for medullary carcinoma, yes. Elective lateral neck dissection, no, uh, for medullary carcinoma. Uh, I would wait to see postoperative calcitonin. If it remains elevated, if my imaging is, uh, is suspicious, then and only then I would consider lateral neck dissection. But electively for medullary carcinoma, lateral neck, no, central neck, yes. Thank you. Uh, there is a question, can I preserve submandibular gland in neck dissection? Yes, you can, provided your elective neck dissection is for larynx and pharynx or thyroid primary. It is unsafe to preserve the submandibular gland for oral cancer because the first HNO lymph nodes are around the submandibular gland, uh, in the convolutions of the submandibular gland, the prevascular facial lymph nodes, the lymph nodes along the anterior belly of digastric. So you are taking too much of a risk in preserving the submandibular gland uh, in doing an elective operation for oral cancer. So for oral cancer, no. For larynx, pharynx, and thyroid, yes, you can. Gentlemen, ladies, I must uh, uh, log out. I have a meeting at 3.30, so I need to- Thank you. We were honored to have you, and we really enjoyed the talk. Uh, if you have time in the future to arrange another talk, we would be delighted. If, if your schedule allows it, maybe after two months or something. Let, let us plan to have a tumor board rather than a talk so I can uh, argue and uh, hear your arguments from uh, learned colleagues like Dr. Kafagi, Dr. Amin, and, and other colleagues. So we should do it in a tumor board format. Okay, let's do that. I will email you, sir, tomorrow to arrange and, another date. Uh, Dr. Amin has a... Uh, International Federation approved fellowship program. So that would be a group could uh, exercise uh, uh, to conduct a tumor board, invite uh, Dr. Kafagi, uh, you know, <clears throat> invite my fr friend Hisham Negum uh, and and few other experts, and let's make it a Egyptian uh, US and a tumor board. We we'll do yes, case. let's do that. Two cases, one hour. And uh, it will be a good good thing to do. And this but is two cases, uh, who brings the cases? Us or we'll you? Do, we'll, do we'll do it. it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Have your residents present. We have an interesting cases a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Good night. Okay. Late for have you. A good, have good. a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for attending, everyone. See you next Monday.